Okay, and uh, yeah, let's start. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to APCTP stream seminar. Uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Christian Falco. He is a postdoc in QMAP of uh, UC Davis, and uh, he made a very interesting progress in the NTT body formation from his PhD. Today, he will give a talk about TT body formation in JT gravity and DF gate theory. Uh, please join me, join me in welcoming our speaker, Christian. All right, great. Thank you very much, Shungi, for the introduction and for the invitation to speak. Uh, so, as he said, today I'll be telling you about this uh, recent work about TT bar deformations in JT gravity and BF gauge theory. So, the paper is based, or sorry, the, the talk is based on this paper with my collaborators, Stephen Ebert, Hao Yu Sun, and Zengbi Sun. And my plan for the talk will be as follows. So, I want to start by giving sort of a broad overview since uh, I know some people in the audience, so uh, Jungi, for instance, has worked on TT bar in the past. So um, for the, the experts, this might be somewhat boring, but for people who have not thought about TT bar, I'd like to give a broad introduction to the deformation and what it's about and how it relates to low dimensional gauge and gravity systems. Uh, and then after that, I'll tell you how to interpret a version of the TT bar deformation as changing the boundary conditions in two dimensional BF gauge theory. In the third part, I'll tell you how to apply that perspective in order to do actual calculations. So how to find corrections to observables like Wilson lines in gauge theories due to TT bar deformations. And at the end, I'll conclude with some future questions and directions for more work. All right, very good. So to begin, I'll have the introduction and background. So broadly speaking, I'm motivated by trying to understand a collection of related models in low dimension. So to sort of orient ourselves, um, we can think about 3D ADS gravity, for instance. And in the usual picture, we think of this as being dual to some conformal field theory. So for instance, the lore is that somehow the gravitational sector of a holographic CFT is described by a Louisville type theory, for instance. So here's kind of the ordinary holographic correspondence. Um, but on the other hand, you can also change variables. And it's known that 3D ADS gravity can be written as a certain SL2 cross SL2 term Simons, which itself can be described as a certain WCW model. So if you like, you can really think of this diagram as being on a torus because the, the top of this one is really connected over uh, to the other side, since there's a certain drinfeld sokolov reduction of WCW, which is the same as Louisville, um, but they're all connected. So there's some collection of theories on the top row. And after dimensional reduction, this gives a, a family of related theories in one lower dimension. So for instance, we come down from ADS gravity to get two-dimensional Jakeev Teitelboim gravity. And the analog of the Chern-Simons description for JT gravity is this BF gauge theory. And in the same way as in the top row, these two two-dimensional theories can be described by one-dimensional quantum mechanical theories, which we can represent either as the Schwarzian theory or a particle moving on a group manifold. So by this, I just mean a kinetic Lagrangian for a particle whose target space is a group, in this case, SL2. So there's many theories here and many relationships between them. So one way that you might want to get a better understanding of the relationship between these theories is to begin with a picture that's comparatively well understood and then deform it, since doing such deformations seems to be useful in many areas of physics. So one example of such a deformation or a place where this has been useful is understanding quantum field theories. So the most familiar textbook example is for a QFT with a Lagrangian description, some S0, an undeformed action. We can add some integrated local operator to get a deformed action, integrating lambda against this operator calligraphic O. And as we know, you can classify such deformations according to the scaling dimension capital delta of the operator O. So depending on the space-time dimension D, if the scaling dimension delta is less than the space-time dimension, we say it's a relevant deformation. An example of at is adding, say, a mass, say, to a free scalar. A marginal deformation, where the scaling dimension matches the space-time dimension, is, for instance, adding a multiple of the kinetic term. So for a 2D compact boson, this marginal deformation is just rescaling the size of the circle for the compact boson, for instance. Mm -hmm. 
And perhaps most mysteriously is an irrelevant deformation where the scaling dimension of the operator is larger than the space-time dimension. An example of which is adding, say, the square of the kinetic term, which is a higher dimension operator. Now, as we know, the first two types I said, marginal and relevant deformations are comparatively well understood. So for instance, marginal deformations parameterize motion on a conformal manifold for a CFT, and a relevant deformation triggers a conventional renormalization group flow. But irrelevant deformations are harder to understand because they modify the definition of the theory in the ultraviolet. Um, and for that reason, they're under less control. So it might come as a surprise that even though irrelevant deformations are generally under less control, we have an example of a well-behaved irrelevant deformation in two space-time dimensions, which is adding the determinant of the energy momentum tensor to the Lagrangian. So the determinant of a two by two matrix can be written in this more Lorentz invariant way as the square of the trace minus this contraction up to a factor. So this looks like a strange thing to do, but surprisingly, this deformation has pretty remarkable properties. And those properties only depend on translation invariance, not conformal invariance. So you can prove properties of this operator in any 2D QFT. So the first property is that although Classically, you might think this combination of stress tensors is perfectly well-defined. At the quantum mechanical level, this involves products of Ts. And as we know, products of local operators are generally divergent. There's some operator product expansion, for instance. So it might be surprising that, in fact, you can take this combination of products of Ts at two different points and then take the points coincident. And in fact, this does define a local operator, OTT bar, up to some total derivative terms which will not be relevant when integrated on a space-time manifold without boundary. So this defines a local operator. But beyond that, this local operator has interesting one-point functions. So for instance, the one-point function of this local TT bar operator has the property that it factorizes. So it can be written as the product of one-point functions of stress tensors in this particular combination. So that's already surprising. Even more surprising is if we begin with an undeformed or seed theory in finite volume. So for instance, on a cylinder of radius R, and that has some spectrum, some energies E sub N of R. Suppose you then deform that theory by adding this TT bar operator to it. Now, if you do that, the energy levels of your deformed theory obey a fairly nice partial differential equation. So this is the inviscid Burgers equation. And in particular, in the special case where the undeformed theory is conformal, you can solve this equation exactly. So the energies in the TT bar deformed theory satisfy the square root formula, which is very nice. Now I should flag at the moment that there's two different behaviors depending on the sign, the sign of lambda. So these are sometimes called the good sign and the bad sign. So if lambda is positive, which is called good, then at least for lambda small enough, the argument of the square root will always be positive and these deformed energies are well-defined. But for lambda negative, if lambda is negative, and for instance, we can set the momentum to zero for a moment. If lambda is negative, then for very high energy states in the CFT, so EN sufficiently large, the product of lambda times the EN will be large enough and negative so that the argument of the square root becomes negative and the energies are complex. So for that reason, this is called the bad sign. And in this talk, I'll focus on the good sign, but I just wanted to introduce that terminology. OK, so we have a nice formula for energies, at least for a CFT seed. That's not the only observable with this nice property. The torus partition function, for instance, also satisfies a nice differential equation. The flat space scattering, or S matrix, uh, is related to the undeformed theory in a simple way by a so-called CDD factor, which is a momentum-dependent phase. So many observables have nice expressions in these TT bar deformed theories. And for a final piece of motivation, if you begin with a seed theory of free bosons and TT bar deformant, at the classical level, the Lagrangian for the deformed theory is that of a gauge fixed Nambu Gotu string. So somehow deforming free bosons is related in some way to string theory. And another signature of this fact is that the high energy density of states in a TT bar deformed theory, beginning from a CFT and then TT bar deforming, um, gives you a density of states with this Hagedorn at high energies. 
unlike a local quantum field theory, which has a Cardi density of states at high energies. So this Hagedorn density of states is another signal that this deformation is somehow related to string theory. Okay, this is all by way of review. So I've only told you so far about kind of the CFT or 2D QFT, if you like, uh, corner this diagram. So you might ask, how does TT bar interact with the different edges in this graph? So for instance, what if I try to go down from a quantum field theory down to a quantum mechanics, a zero plus one dimensional theory? So how is the TT bar deformation of a 2D QFT related to other theories in this web? Well, the dimensional reduction was studied in two papers by the same authors in 2019. And what they found is you can dimensionally reduce this TT bar operator to obtain a flow, say in Euclidean signature, for the Euclidean action of quantum mechanics theory. So here I'm using the symbol I for the integral of the Hamiltonian against Euclidean time. So there's a strange looking um, deformation that has this rational function of the Hamiltonian. But although it looks strange, this flow equation has a simple solution that the deformed Hamiltonian is simply a function of the undeformed Hamiltonian with a similar square root form as for the energies we saw before. So this is not such a bad deformation. Um, it tells you the energy eigenstates of the undeformed theory remain energy eigenstates in the deformed theory, although their energy eigenvalues are modified in some prescribed way, according to this formula. Okay, so that's not so bad. That's one direction in the graph I showed you, the web of theories is coming down, dimensional reduction. Um, what about holography? Well, here it's somewhat more complicated. Um, there's been many proposals to interpret TT bar holographically, and I won't describe all of them since they're not all directly relevant for this analysis. Um, just briefly to mention some of them, um, there's a slightly different version of TT bar called single trace, which you can ask me about if you'd like at the end, I can tell you somewhat more about, but that version of the TT bar operator is related to taking an ADS spacetime and modifying it to a linear dilaton spacetime. Um, and this is related to little string theory. But for the familiar double trace version of TT bar, which is the one I've defined for you, the DET T, um, the one studied by Zamolodzikov, uh, that's the version we'd like to focus on. There's another proposal which is for the bad sign of TT bar and for the double trace version, that the holographic interpretation of TT bar is somehow taking an ADS spacetime and giving it a finite radial cutoff. So the spacetime is cut off at some finite radial distance R. Um, that's one proposal, but it has some issues. Uh, I mean, I, I stray from, or I tend not to look at the bad sign version of TT bar because I have conceptual issues with these complex energies at high energies. So because of the complex energies, and there are questions of whether it makes sense to define a theory of quantum gravity in a space-time with a finite cutoff. So for that reason, I'm not going to discuss this proposal for the bad sign uh, cutoff ADS picture in this talk. Instead, I'll focus on the good sign double trace deformation. And uh, for the good sign version, there's an interpretation which was offered by Monica Guica and Ruben Montan. And that interpretation is as follows. If you begin in ADS with a Pfefferman Gram expansion of the metric, so it's known that you can expand in three dimensions um, any ADS, asymptotically ADS metric in the following form in terms of three metric coefficients, met expansion coefficients for the metric, where here rho is some radial coordinate. As rho goes to zero, we go to the boundary. And in fact, G4 is related to G0 and G2 in this expansion. In the usual holographic dictionary, we view G0 or gamma as the boundary metric. So the metric um, going out towards the CFT at the boundary. And we view it as being the source, which is dual to the stress tensor, the holographic stress tensor. That's the undeformed dictionary. The proposal for TT bar is that we modify that variational principle or that holographic dictionary by introducing a new metric, this gamma of lambda, which is a particular combination of the undeformed G0 and its radial derivatives, which we give you G2 and G4. And we declare that this new metric gamma of lambda 
will be the source for the stress tensor. So this is a modified variational principle whereby we have a new source dual to an expectation value interpreted as the stress tensor. So we can view this in some sense as a mixed boundary condition for the metric because the undeformed theory has a variational principle where the metric is held fixed at the boundary, which is the G0 component is held fixed. But in the new set of boundary conditions, we say, no, no, instead of a particular combination of the metric G2 and G4. So that seems a bit innocent. It's changing to some mixed boundary condition, um, but it's some, it seems a bit stranger when we remember that G2, the second piece of the metric in this expansion, can be identified with the boundary stress tensor. So with this identification, the new metric gamma is a combination of the metric and the stress tensor. So this change of boundary conditions is somewhat strange from the field theory perspective, because this is saying we have a different modified metric for each background that has a different choice of the stress tensor. It's somehow like a stress tensor dependent metric, which is kind of an odd thing to think about. It's like a state dependent change in the metric or a state dependent diffeomorphism, which is a bit unusual. Um, and we'll see in the lower dimensional cases that there's some similar structure that will emerge. Some strange state dependent modifications will, um, will come up. Okay. Uh, here, uh, why lambda, here there is, a there does not seem to be any restriction on the lambda, but the, this is for the portfolio for a good sign. So is there some reason why in this approach, is there some reason why, why lambda is positive? Good, yeah, not necessarily. So this proposal um, does work for either the, the good or the bad sign of lambda. For the bad sign of lambda when lambda is negative, you can show that this change in the boundary conditions is the same as um, imposing Dirichlet boundary conditions for the metric at a particular radius RC, which is a function of lambda. So for the bad sign, it reduces to this sort of cutoff proposal. For the good sign, it's not Dirichlet at any finite cutoff. It's only modified asymptotics, which I find easier to think about in the good sign case. Um, good question. Other questions um, about this sort of review and background? Okay, um, good, okay. So that was um, a long preamble in some sense. So with that review, I want to come back to sort of the, this motivating question for the talk. So now that we've seen that there's some sort of modified boundary conditions uh, proposed for the 3D gravity picture, you could say, well, how do those modified boundary conditions appear or manifest in the lower dimensional versions of TT bar, like BF gauge theory? Um, that's what I'll try to address. So I'll, I'll tell you how um, you should change the boundary conditions for BF gauge theory fields in order to correspond to the dimensionally reduced TT bar deformation. So that'll be the topic of the next part, part two. Okay, so any other questions about the review before I go on to the next part? Okay, no other questions. Um, and feel free to stop me. It said at one point my internet was unstable. So if you lose me and need me to repeat anything, just let me know. Um, okay, so in this section now we want to come down. So we dimensionally reduce to a two dimensional gauge theory with a one dimensional boundary. And as we've seen, we know how to deform a one dimensional quantum mechanics by that dimensionally reduced TT bar um, by Gross and Shigulian and other authors. So now we ask, what have you done to the bulk BF gauge theory fields if you deform the boundary by that operator? So first, just to review and fix notation, um, we remember that at least in Euclidean signature, uh, the BF theory action is written like this. So it's a trace of a space-time scalar phi and a space-time two form F, but both of those phi and F are SL2 valued fields. So because they're SL2 valued, we can expand both phi and A, where F is the field strength of A, we can expand them in generators of the SL2 Lie algebra as follows. So we have some E plus E minus and omega for A and phi plus phi minus and phi zero for phi. So those are our expansions. And here I've only written the bulk action without boundary term, but in some sense, all of the action uh, is at the boundary. All of the interesting dynamics lives at the boundary because this theory is topological. 
So the choice of boundary term is very important. So which boundary term do we want to add? There's several choices. Uh, I'll first uh, show you the variation of the on-shell actions to see what we get if we had no boundary term. So in terms of those expansion coefficients, phi and E, if you vary the bulk action and um, localize to a boundary integral, without adding any boundary term, we get some combination like this. So first, suppose we wanted to choose a boundary term that would be similar to JT gravity, since JT gravity is a, is a rewriting of BF gauge theory. So in JT gravity, the JT dilaton capital phi, which is proportional to phi zero in our variables, is held fixed at the boundary. So if you wanted to implement a variational principle where phi zero is held fixed at the boundary, you could add this boundary term, I boundary, which is um, a total derivative that localizes to the boundary. And when varied, you get two terms from varying this combination. One of them cancels the first term here. And we're left with a variation of the form at the bottom. So you can see with this choice of variation, we're left with a combination that has a delta phi zero. So to make the variation vanish, we would have to impose delta phi zero vanishes, which is the statement that phi zero is held fixed at the boundary. So this choice of boundary term is in some sense similar, the most similar to the JT gravity uh, picture. Uh, is it Euclidean or Lorentzian? Here I'm going to do Euclidean. Uh, so this will be, tau will be a uh, kind of Euclidean uh, time for the boundary. Okay. Yeah. Good. Uh, okay, so finally, uh, on the next slide, I'll present the first result, uh, the first thing that's not review. So with this choice of boundary conditions, you could ask, what operator should I add on the boundary in order to implement a boundary TT bar deformation? So what should I add? So it turns out, if you think for a while and look for the right combination of the BF theory fields, yeah, you'll you're saying TT bar deformation in the one dimension on the boundary, or? That's right, yeah, I should, I should be totally clear since um, we're talking about a 2D BF theory, but I don't want to TT bar deform the BF theory itself since it's topological, so there's no stress tensor. Um, when I say TT bar or TT bar like, I mean, indeed, deform the 1D boundary by the dimensionally reduced TT bar and then ask, what have I done to the bulk fields? So that's right. Okay. Good, okay. So in terms of the bulk fields, the claim is that one can add a combination of this form. So this is some mixture of the expansion coefficients of phi and A that's sort of cooked up so that it matches um, the boundary one-dimensional TT bar deformation. So this thing we claim is um, consistent with the other presentations of the TT bar type deformation for the other theories on this web. So to be clear, what I mean by that is that if we go all the way back to this picture at the beginning, um, I've proposed a boundary TT bar deformation for this BF theory. And the claim is that if you take the definitions of TT bar, which have already been proposed in Chern Simons theory or in JT gravity, um, those are th that they're consistent if you kind of map along any of the edges of this graph. If you map the existing proposals, they'll be consistent with the one that we just wrote down. So, in some sense, since I've also discussed the JT gravity TT bar, in some sense, this is like showing that this little subdiagram commutes. You can define TT bar on any of the corners, and it will be consistent with TT bar um, on any of the other corners of this little subsquare. Good. So let me come back to the proposal. Uh, sorry, one more. Uh, okay. So this is a differential equation, then. So you could ask, what is the solution? So, what have you done if you add this quantity? to your BF theory and attempt to solve the flow equation. So although the operator looks very complicated with this strange combination uh, of expansion coefficients, the solution ends up being very nice. So to ease notation, let me just define E to be this measure factor, so the root of uh, gamma tau tau. So we can actually solve this flow equation by replacing our old undeformed sources which again were phi zero and e tau plus minus. Those were the sources uh, that were dual to some expectation values in the holographic dictionary. So all you do is replace those undeformed sources with deformed sources that have 
additional lambda dependent terms added on the right side. So you add some lambda times this combination for the top and lambda times uh, omega tau for this e tau plus minus. Now, this is somewhat surprising since we've only added a term linear in lambda, but the claim is that this solves the TT bar flow to all orders in lambda. This is not a first order approximation. This, uh, this change of boundary conditions implements the TT bar flow kind of non-perturbatively in lambda. So that's somewhat surprising. Um, the other surprise is that, uh, whereas in the metric picture that we saw before, there was a certain mixing of the source and expectation value for the metric field, in BF variables, it's somewhat different since if we go back, we can see that somehow um, here phi zero is the source and the dual expectation value is omega tau. And the Vielbeins or the Einbeins, I guess, for the boundary world line, the E's are the sources and the phi's are their dual expectation values in the holographic dictionary. So here we've somehow mixed each source into the expectation value for the other field. So E is the source, but it's being mixed into the expectation value for phi zero. And phi zero is a source, but it's being mixed into the expectation values phi minus and phi plus for the other fields. So this is somehow like an asymmetric change in the boundary conditions where you're mixing sources into expectation values for other fields. Okay. So some more comments on this sort of deformation. So as I said, we mix kind of these sources into expectation values for the other fields. That's already surprising. Um, you could ask, okay, so what is the deformed variational principle? So it's quite simple to require that the variation of the action vanish. All we need to do is impose that the new lambda dependent sources are held fixed at the boundary. So the variations of these quantities vanish, but the dual expectation values are not deformed. So phi plus minus and omega tau do not change. So I should say that's kind of analogous. It's, it's uh, consistent with the picture you would get from TT bar deforming 3D gravity and churn simons variables. So this has been studied. The analog of what I told you in metric variables where we replaced the gamma, the metric gamma with some gamma of lambda. In churn simons variables, there's a similar story to the one I just showed you where the boundary Vielbein, now for the two-dimensional boundary in this case, becomes dependent on its dual expectation value which in that paper is called F, but F is really just encoding the boundary stress tensor. So this is a similar mixing as in the 3D case, although here it has the asymmetry I mentioned. And to connect with this strange kind of state dependent change of boundary conditions I mentioned for the metric, uh, there's a similar interpretation here since this E tau, again, you can think of as an Einbein along the boundary world line. So changing E tau is somehow like a re-parameterization or a diffeomorphism of the world line. But now that diffeomorphism depends on this operator dual to phi zero. So in some sense, again, it's a, a state dependent or a, a phi zero uh, operator dependent world line re-parameterization. It's not a global re-parameterization of the world line, but one that depends on the expectation value of one of the other fields, which is a bit strange. Okay. And, uh, so here, boundary, uh, BF theory or this uh, uh, 2D gravity, the boundary would be this uh, original one is will be Schwarzschild theory. Here, we will right. show the some deformed, uh, some deformation of the Schwarzschild also later. Or... Oh, good. Yeah. So uh, with this choice of boundary conditions, um, the this is not dual to the Schwarzian with this boundary term. Um, so in a second on the next slide, I'll tell you um, how to modify this, because um, as it turns out, the, the choice of boundary term we added in order to make this look like JT gravity is not mm -hmm. quite the boundary term you should add in order to make this dual to the Schwarzian. So to get a deformed Schwarzian, um, you need to do a slightly different procedure, which I'll describe in, in just a minute. Yeah. Okay. Good. Other questions? And the original, like a, a BF theory or 2D gravity, it has like a, a symmetry or like a, that itself has some kind of this isometry symmetry, like SL2 symmetry. So under this change of the boundary condition, 
what happened with that? Is it still preservable or somehow it's broken? Oh, good. So certainly um, deep in the bulk, since we haven't changed any bulk fields, so the bulk isometries will be exactly preserved. So the SL2 um, in the bulk is fine. As you okay. go out towards the boundary, it's still the case that the um, SL2 will act in some sense on the undeformed fields in the usual way, uh, but it will act in a different way on the modified fields, since you would have to act with the SL2 on kind of the lambda independent fields and then infer the way that it acts on the lambda dependent fields, since it acts on each of the components differently, right? Okay. Very good. Okay, so. Um, good. The question predicted uh, kind of the next obvious thing to ask, which is um, since the previous boundary condition I added, the total derivative I added is not quite what you would want to add in order to make this theory dual to the boundary, boundary Schwarzian theory. Um, in order to get that correspondence, you should add a slightly different boundary term, which I've written here. Looks like trace phi squared. There's different ways to motivate this boundary term. Um, in the paper by Berlinda and Pufu and others, uh, um, there's a picture of this as inserting a sort of bound, uh, a defect, defect string um, where you kind of have this trace phi squared term um, arising from the, the string defect and then you take the string defect kind of far away. That's one way to think about it. Another way to think is by dimensional reduction of 3D term Simons. If you dimensionally reduce the 3D term Simons action on a circle, you'll get a term that looks like the integral of trace AT squared which when identified, uh, AT becomes phi upon dimensional reduction. So you come down and get a trace phi squared, uh, which motivates this term from the Chern Simons picture. So regardless of how you want to motivate it, I'll take this boundary term as given and ask with this boundary term, what should I do in order to TT bar deform? So first we can ask, well, what is the boundary variation? So what variational principle should I impose with this new choice of boundary term? Well, if you vary, you now get a different boundary variation, which looks like this. So there's a trace of a difference of two terms, a phi delta a tau minus a phi delta phi. And in order to make this vanish, we pick a different variational principle, which is we demand that at the boundary, a tau is equal to phi. Since if these two are equal, this becomes trace of phi delta phi minus phi delta phi, which vanishes. So after making that choice, this boundary condition, the boundary term, the boundary action becomes just the integral of trace a tau squared, or if you like, it's the trace of phi squared, uh, which is the same since they're identified. Okay, so this I claim is different than the analysis I showed you a moment ago. Um, so in this case, phi zero, it's now identified with the component of A, so it's no longer an independent source. Before it was an independent source dual to some omega tau. And as it turns out, the operator I showed you before uh, only reproduces the TT bar deformation, only gives the correct behavior when omega tau is the expectation value dual to the source phi zero. So when, with this choice of boundary condition, the previous analysis will no longer work and we need to choose a different deformation to do. So to guess what that different deformation we should do for the Schwarzian is, uh, we can get some guidance. We can get a guess by looking at the boundary quantum mechanics. So uh, I have a question in the previous slide. Oh, good. So here, boundary term is can be written in terms of the, this SL two field A or phi. But the in the your previous boundary condition, is it possible to write down the in the here in the previous uh, the, your boundary condition? You write down in terms of your component field, but the, is it possible to write down them as like a gauge field or, or like a SL two? Covariant way or right. That's like a good that. question. Um, I don't know in this in this case. Um, so here we add something in components. Indeed, in the previous in the previous case, I think um, in the in the three D churn Simon's case, it's possible to write the analog of this boundary term as something like an a wedge a and an a bar wedge a bar. Um, I haven't written down. I think uh, the way to do this in BF variables. So. It might be something, might be something similar, like a um, B wedge. Yeah, I'm not sure how to write this in BF variables actually. So um, there may be a way to write this in BF variables, but 
I think it's very unlikely that you'll be able to write the mixing um, which solves the flow equation in terms of the gauge fields themselves instead of the components. Since this explicitly rotates different components that have uh, kind of different properties under the SL2 expansion in terms of the gauge fields. So um, that's another difference between the boundary conditions. The first one is very natural in components and the second one is more natural in terms of the gauge fields themselves. Okay. Good. Thank you. Um, okay. Good. So for the, the second choice of boundary conditions that corresponds to the short scene, um, what should we do? Well, one way to sort of guess what one should do is to use the deformation of the quantum mechanics and attempt to map the variables between BF variables and the quantum mechanics variables. So um, to sort of make the correspondence, you could, uh, you could go through the following reasoning. You could say, well, in the undeformed theory, the equation of motion sets the connection to be flat, so zero field strength, which means a mu is pure gauge. And if a mu is pure gauge, the boundary term from a moment ago, which was just trace of a tau squared, well, now a tau is just g inverse d, d tau of g for some group element g. And that means the boundary term is just the square of that. So trace g inverse dg, g inverse dg, which looks like a sort of WZW type model, but in uh, quantum mechanics. It's just, uh, this can be rewritten as just a kinetic Lagrangian for a particle X, which is, you know, XI is, you know, some map from R into the SL2 group manifold now. So this is a particle with target space SL2. Here, the lowercase g is the natural metric on SL2 induced by the killing form. So this is a purely kinetic Lagrangian. And that's good because we know how to TT bar deform that from the quantum mechanics, because we saw way before in the quantum mechanical um, deformation of Gross et al. that in this case, you can deform the Hamiltonian for a quantum mechanics by simply replacing the Hamiltonian with a function of the undeformed Hamiltonian. So our guess for this choice of boundary conditions would be that somehow you should attempt to define a deformation with the property that the old boundary action, the trace a tau squared, is replaced by something that looks like the same square root, some strange square root of the trace a tau squared under, under the square root. So we'll ask what, what uh, should we add in order to implement this? Okay, so after some thinking, one finds that you can get that as a solution by adding a strange looking double trace deformation, a strange looking bilinear to the action. So. Um, here to distinguish, since sometimes the stress tensor T in zero dimensions is used to refer to the Hamiltonian itself, since T00 is naturally the Hamiltonian. So I want to distinguish between the Hamiltonian H and the Euclidean Hilbert stress tensor, which is just the metric variation of the Euclidean Lagrangian. These two agree for a purely kinetic theory, but they will not be the same for a more complicated theory. So T Hilb will be this Hilbert stress tensor and H is the usual Hamiltonian. So we find that if you do this strange deformation where you deform by the product of H and the Hilbert stress tensor, which looks kind of like TT bar um, in some sense, in, in the sense that H is somehow like the, the zero plus one dimensional stress tensor, but not quite. Deforming by this strange con combination, as it turns out, gives you exactly the flow which implements that square root of the trace A tau squared. And this is somewhat nice because for the previous set of boundary conditions, you could also write that strange combination in component fields that I showed you. It can also be written as a product of an operator O times the Hilbert stress tensor, where the operator O in that case was the op operator dual to phi zero. So in some sense, we've just replaced O with the Hamiltonian with this choice of boundary conditions and making that replacement gives us the correct flow that has the correct square root properties. Now, I'm not sure how to interpret this as a mixture of sources and expectation values, because in the previous case, this O times the Hilbert stress tensor, it mixed the sources and expectation values in a fairly simple way. As we saw, it mixed the phi zero and E plus minus into expectation values of the opposite fields. So you would think maybe in this case, there's a similar mixing, um, but in this case, we can interpret the Hilbert stress tensor as being somehow the source, or sorry, the, the, the operator dual to the sources, which are the Einbeins, E plus minus. But I don't know how to interpret the Hamiltonian as um, 
the operator dual to some source. I don't know what the source for the Hamiltonian is. Uh, can um, you give us an example where these two are different? I'll give an example where the two are different, you said? Yes, for example. So I uh, can you already elaborate uh, why, I mean, the difference of these two? Right. So yeah, even for, for instance, in a case with that, with the square root, so the if you have, say, the one over two lambda times the root um, one plus x dot x dot, um, say minus one, oh, sorry, lambda x dot x dot minus one, the case with the square root. Um, in this case, the Hamiltonian is this combination. But if you take the metric derivative of this Hamiltonian, really, this is, there's a, also a root gamma when you couple it to gravity you'll get two contributions from the metric derivative. When the metric derivative hits this combination, you get the Hamiltonian itself. But when the metric derivative hits the g tau tau appearing under the square root, you'll get an, an additional combination that's kind of one over two square root times some other stuff. Um, so the two, H will be equal to T Hilbert if and only if, if and only if, the Hamiltonian is of the form um, kind of say g tau tau times some scalar. So times metric independent. So an example of that would be if it's g tau tau times x dot x dot, like a, an ordinary kinetic Lagrangian, then the two agree. But mm -hmm. if the thing multiplying g tau tau has more complicated metric dependence, then they will disagree. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you. OK. Um, very good. So I was uh, I'm, I, I kind of apologetically telling you that uh, I don't have as clean of a holographic interpretation for this strange combination, but um, it's a proposal for a flow which gives the correct result in the case of the Schwarzian. And since it gives the square root um, of this trace a tau squared, it gives this as um, the result. I'll kind of take this operator as a working definition and uh, just use it to do some computations in the next section. So that's the end of the section on the boundary conditions. Um, in the last section, I'll try to show you how to use this to do various calculations. But before that, I'll stop and see if there's any other questions. No questions, okay. All right, very good. Um, so you could ask, um, if you're going to use the formalism you just developed to compute something, what should you compute? Well, the first thing, I guess, in, uh, in gauge theories, you might think that Wilson lines and loops are fundamental observables and good things to think about. So a Wilson loop, for instance, is a nice gauge invariant quantity that measures some holonomy at a connection. So maybe that's a good observable to look at. So for instance, I'll first do somehow the more, perhaps more familiar or more common uh, case, which is the 3D gravitational turn assignments. So in that case, you can kind of think of uh, maybe there's some, some cylinder, and I'll give a cross-section of the cylinder, and you can have two boundary anchored points, like a capital Z1 and a capital Z2. And you can think of some Wilson line as some quantity that comes in off of the conformal boundary some, somewhere into the bulk, and then goes off and then hits the conformal boundary again. And the definition of the operator in that case is the usual path-ordered exponential in the Wilson line of the one form a mu integrated against dx mu. So that's the usual Wilson line in uh, SL2 cross SL2 churn uh, Simons for 3D gravity. And I'll show you how we can kind of use modified boundary conditions, not the BF ones I showed you before, but the analogous ones for 3D churn Simons. I'll first show you how we can use that to get some computational mileage. So to review the undeformed story, so with no lambda turned on, you would usually choose what's called a Bagnados type connection or a Bagnados type parametrization, which is essentially performing a diffeomorphism so that the coefficient of L plus or L1, uh, the, the L plus generator of the Lie algebra is one. So you can get rid of the coefficient of L1 and then write the Wilson line in the simpler form where the only coordinate dependence enters through the stress tensor multiplying L minus one. So that's a nice uh, parameterization one could make. And there's many calculations in the, in the literature showing how to um, evaluate this, how to promote it to a quantum operator where the stress tensor is no longer a number, but now the operator in, in the CFT. 
And in that case, one can perform calculations. And there's evidence that's been provided that in that case, this W transforms as a bilocal primary in the CFT. So that's kind of like the nice usual story. Things get a little more difficult when you TT bar deform. So when you deform, let me first show you the analog of the modified boundary conditions from BF theory in 3D transignments. So this was known from previous work. We, we checked that these boundary conditions are compatible upon dimensional reduction with the ones that we derived for BF theory. Um, but in 3D transignments, if you expand your boundary gauge field, so here I use lowercase a for the boundary gauge field. Capital A was the gauge field that also has a radial component. The boundary gauge field also admits an expansion in SL2 generators, L plus minus and L0. So I put the E as the L plus generator and the F as the L minus, and there's a corresponding um, expansion for A bar. So with those expansions, the solution to the TT bar flow is again to mix the sources and expectation values in a way linear and lambda. So the E's, which can be interpreted as the boundary veal binds, become dependent on a linear and lambda term multiplying the F's. The F's have an interpretation of the boundary stress tensor, and the F's are undeformed. So this is very analogous to the BF picture, where you have a mixing of sources and expectation bounds. Uh, on the right hand side of the F, is it the F0 or F lambda? It should be F0. the right hand side of the first equation, the F. Oh, of e. oh yeah, this, well, since F, uh, F of zero and F of lambda ah, are the same. Yeah, so this could okay. be either. Yeah, that yeah. could be either one. Good. Very good. Um, okay, good. So, and that's a very nice feature of this, that since the, the stress tensor is undeformed, you can use the same stress tensor at finite lambda as at finite lambda, as at um, zero lambda. So F doesn't change, and also the stress tensor doesn't change. So in the lower equation at the bottom, I've used the same symbol TZZ of Y as we had in the undeformed theory because the stress tensor in these variables isn't changing. Um, okay. So the nice feature of this is that now the Wilson line, which before had a coefficient of the L1 generator, which was simply one. Now, all we need to do is replace this with the deformed Vielbein, which now depends on the stress tensor. And now there's going to be some mixing. This is no longer of the nice Bagnato's form, uh, which you could use standard techniques to compute. Um, so you have to do some tricks, and it's kind of difficult to do in the more general case. But in the paper, we show in a sort of toy example for a classical uh, field configuration with a constant stress tensor background. So replacing TZZ of Y with just a constant TZZ, we show that you can evaluate this um, exactly. So you can compute the deformed Wilson line. Um, and even though that example is very simple, uh, a constant stress, constant stress tensor background um, it includes cases like a bulk BTZ black hole with some mass and spin. Um, so if you want to see that solution, um, you can ask at the end and maybe I can show you, but for the interest of time, I think I have um, 10 minutes. So I'll try to quickly speed through and tell you a little bit about the quantum Wilson line and then the BF uh, calculation. So at the quantum level, oh, sorry. Oh, no, no, it's a chunk sign on 3D, it's not the 2D. I'm oh, sorry, yeah, this is, this is for the 3D transcendence. That's right. Good. Yeah. Um, good. So still for the 3D, um, still the 3D transcendence, but now at the quantum level, um, now you can promote the Wilson line to an operator, and you can ask about the expectation values of that operator in some state. So for instance, between a highest and lowest weight state of the SL2, which is a nice quantity to, to look at, these are harder to compute, even without turning on TT bar because one has an infinite series of quantum corrections in one over C, and there are divergences at every order that have to be regularized. Um, so this part of our paper is somewhat technical, so I'll, I'll kind of flash some results and just uh, kind of describe the big picture. Uh, essentially, we content ourselves with just consistency checks of corrections in lambda to these correlators. So for instance, the holomorphic Wilson line W um, picks up a correction that begins at order lambda squared. So the order lambda contribution vanishes. The first contribution is at order lambda squared. And we compute this using just conformal perturbation theory. So the one way you could compute this is the most naive thing you could do. You just do conformal perturbation theory about the undeformed theory by adding TT bar, and you get this result. Then we compute it in a different way. We say take the modified sources EIA of lambda and plug them into the definition and expand that. 
Um, that's not obviously the same since the upper, I mean, it's not pulling down a TT bar operator the same way as you would in conformal perturbation theory. It's using the modified source from the previous slide. But even though they're not obviously the same, the results are compatible, which is a good um, consistency check that this solution is giving you the right behavior for the Wilson line. And we do a second consistency check for a product a correlation function of a holomorphic and anti-holomorphic Wilson line. The nice feature of this is that um, the corrections begin at order lambda instead of order lambda squared. And we evaluate that again via conformal perturbation theory and compare it to some results of CARDI. So CARDI showed in a paper on TT bar to form correlation functions that correlators to leading order in lambda can be related to certain derivatives acting on undeformed correlators. And he gives some expression for, for that relationship. And we find via conformal perturbation theory that the Wilson line satisfies that same, that same equation. So the Wilson line is again acting like a bilocal operator in a CFT, the same way that Cardi would have told you. Okay. And for the last part, so I told you all about modified boundary conditions and BF theory. So let me tell you how to use our results to do cal calculations there as well. And again, this is a bit technical, so I'll, I'll kind of give the main ideas and suppress some, some details. But um, we saw that using our strange um, H times this, the Hilbert stress tensor deformation, um, that recreates a particular change in the boundary action, which has a square root of a trace AT squared, or equivalently, again, you could replace this with trace phi squared. That's the same. So we could now ask, what if you compute Wilson lines in the BF theory, where you change the boundary potential for the scalar field, which in the usual case would just be proportional to trace phi squared with some coupling constant nu, which I'd set to one before, but now I'm restoring. Suppose you change that to the formula for the potential that we saw a moment ago that now has the square root in it. You could ask, can you do calculations for BF theory Wilson lines with this potential, this modification to the boundary term? Okay, so this calculation can be done. We essentially followed the techniques developed in the paper I mentioned before by Verlinde and Pufu et al. So uh, their calculation is, uh, it, again, somewhat technical, but the idea is to construct the Wilson lines from the disk partition function Z and with a particular choice of gauge group. So the gauge group that we take and which they take is this combination of SL2 twiddle, which is the universal cover of SL2, SL2 cross R modded out by some Z subgroup. The Z subgroup we're modding out by acts on the two factors above as follows. So it acts on a G twiddle in the universal cover SL2 twiddle by acting with some element HN. So HN is the nth element of the center Z. So the center of SL2 twiddle, the universal cover, is isomorphic to the integers. And it acts on the real number R just by a shift by some number B. So this number B we treat as a parameter that defines a particular extension. So just keeping track of parameters, we have a capital B, we have this coupling constant nu, we have beta, which is just the inverse temperature, and some G, which is a holonomy since the boundary is essentially a circle. So there's some holonomy, some SL2 or some group element as you go around the boundary. Okay, so we choose this gauge group again for technical reasons and also do a Fourier transform following the Verlinda et al. paper for technical reasons. So one takes the partition function I defined and does a particular Fourier transform over this theta, which was again, the coordinate in the, the reals when we took the product of SL2 twiddle and the reals. So you Fourier transform against that, that real quantity with some Fourier space K0. So now this Fourier transform partition function depends on K0. And after this fairly complicated song and dance, now we can actually compute after doing this Fourier transform. So if we set K0 to some particular number and take some limit of this B, then the calculation can be done um, in this large B limit. You have to keep track of contributions from different representations. So SL2 twiddle has various representations. There's a principal series, which is continuous and labeled by some quantity, one half plus IS for some continuous S. And there's a discrete series representation. Um, and in the undeformed theory, the principal series is the one which, which dominates. So we find after this calculation, when you TT bar deform, the principal series remains dominant 
so long as this little inequality is satisfied. So this is a condition relating the temperature and the lambda, the TT bar parameter lambda. But once you make lambda too large, so as you crank up lambda, so the, right, the left side gets smaller and eventually the inequality is violated, at that lambda or equivalently at that temperature, because the inverse temperature um, is also getting smaller uh, in that limit, at that particular combination of parameters, there's a phase transition where now the representation switch and the discrete series contributions begin to matter. The principal series no longer dominates. Now that's very interesting because we saw way back at the beginning when we wrote this formula for the energies of TT bar deformed theories that for the good sign of the deformation parameter lambda positive and for the ground state energy of a CFT, which is negative, E0 is minus C over 12, where C is the central charge, there's also a value of lambda when you make lambda too large at which something strange happens, where it looks like the square root is going uh, complex and that's interpreted as a Hagedorn transition. There's a transition where um, the partition function no longer converges and lambda is getting too large and behavior is very strange. So the nice thing about this result is that uh, that Hagedorn phase transition in the 2D picture corresponds to this phase transition in the BF theory upon dimensional reduction. So this gives a different interpretation of this critical value of lambda where strange things are happening to the partition function. In the BF theory, the interpretation is that here, the discrete series becomes important and you can no longer use this TT bar deformed Schwarzian theory as a good description of the theory anymore. There's some other, some other theory take, come, takes over. Uh, so here I understand something happening when the, this, in this point, but the, uh, is, what, is it Hageton, is it related to Hageton transition or, or just uh, some, is there yeah, we any believe, relation to the Hageton? Yeah, good. Um, so we, we believe that it is related to the Hageton phase transition. It's, it's, um, Difficult to see this directly by mapping mapping the parameters because the in the 2D CFT, the Hagedorn phase transition depends on the central charge of the CFT and on the lambda and on the temperature. And these have to be mapped down into the BF theory variables where this is not written in terms of C, but in terms of um, different variables. But um, we believe they're occurring at the same place. And one way to see this is that at least from the, the 2D perspective, the only place at which a phase transition happens, the phase diagram is very simple. It's essentially Cardi-like below a particular temperature and becomes Hagedorn at a particular temperature. And that's the only transition. And upon dimensional reduction, we also find there's only two phases, one where the principal series dominates and one where the discrete series dominates. So in effect, there could have been only one phase transition um, in the two cases. So you would have expected it had to agree. Or let me change the, the uh, question. The, uh, what about the this behavior of the, or F, can you estimate the, the density of states from the, this uh, partition function? Oh, estimate the density of states in the uh, reduced theory, in, in this C. Yeah, um, yeah so that uh, maybe one can see the, some Hagedon like behavior. Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah. I think you should be able to. We, we, we didn't do this explicitly in the paper, but I think if you estimate the high energy density of states and then find the point at which it's going Hagedorn, it should, I think, correspond to the same point at which um, when we take this large B limit and find the contributions from the two series, uh, mm -hmm. it should correspond to the crossover point. I think that's a good check. Uh, we haven't done that, but that's, um, that's a good point. Good, okay. Well, I'm almost out of time. So let me just come to the, the summary and the future directions in the last minute or so. Um, so to summarize, we, we saw that this um, TCT bar deformation and its reduced form, the zero plus one dimensional form, can be given some interpretations in terms of mixed boundary conditions in various contexts, in 3D gravity, 3D transimons, 2D DF theory, 2D JT gravity, and they all appear to be consistent. So one of our main results was explicitly describing those modified boundary conditions in BF theory for two different choices of the boundary term, one which looks more like GT gravity and one which looks more like the Schwarzian with this extra trace phi squared, uh, the string defect, if you like. And then we explained that that change of boundary conditions can be used to compute boundary anchored Wilson lines, um, both in the 3D transimons and in the 2D BF.
which gives us kind of some nice observables, some nice calculations we can do with the formalism. So just to conclude, um, future things we'd like to work on. Everything that we discussed was in the case of SL2 in this talk. So the natural question is, can you generalize these re results to some SLN theory, like higher spin churn assignments? So SL3, for instance, corresponds to bulk gravity coupled to a spin three, massless spin three degree of freedom. You could ask about that. These were all classical groups, but you could ask about the extension to supergroups, which would give you a supersymmetric, the F theory. Um, another question is related to recoupling of near horizon regimes. So what I mean by that is the single trace TT bar deformation, which I didn't tell you about, but I can if you'd like in the discussion. Um, it has a nice interpretation from a gravity solution of F strings and NS5 brains, where this, the single trace TT bar deformation is interpreted as taking you from a near horizon region and zooming out and recoupling a sort of throat region that's kind of further from the horizon. So you could ask, does our irrelevant deformation um, have some interpretation similarly in some black hole system? So for instance, it's known that the uh, near extremal near horizon limit of a 40 black hole is described by JT gravity due to some work by Maldacena et al. So you could ask, if you deform JT gravity in the way that we've written down, does that have some interpretation from the black hole picture? That could be interesting. And finally, um, we flagged that there's something happening at this Hagedorn temperature where this transition where the discrete series is becoming important and some other theory takes over. So you could ask, what is that theory? What, what's going on and how do we describe what happens beyond that phase transition? So I believe that answering some or all of these questions could give us new insights on low dimensional gauge theories and gravity theories in the same way that TT bar has been very successful at doing in the case of two dimensional quantum field theories. So with that, let me stop and thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much for the very clear and the nice talk. Great, thank you. Please ask a question. Uh, let me ask the one question. So I have some question, but the, let me ask first this question in this slide. So you mentioned that it's SLM, or if it's SL3, so though you can one can also imagine that this uh, TT body formation generation of the TT body formation in the higher spin. So probably we know that uh, in two D shifty there is a uh, W three uh, some shifty with W three. So would it be possible to consider W three W three bar deformation like? Yes. Yeah. Uh, good. That's. That's something I'm very interested in. So there's there's two possible deformations you could imagine doing. So if you take, as you pointed out, you could take SL3 churn Simons in the bulk, and that's dual to a CFT with a W algebra, right? The W3 algebra. So this CFT has a stress tensor. So one direction you could go in is TT bar deforming that CFT and getting some, I don't know, I'll call it CFT lambda. But we also know that TT bar is not the only irrelevant deformation with nice properties. So Zomologikov and Smirnov showed that there's a higher tower of higher spin deformations. And in some cases, they've been studied and have nice properties. So you could also imagine deforming this in a different direction by some WW bar, like you say, some other deformation. Um, I don't know what to call this deformation parameter, maybe mu instead of lambda. And then you could get some you know, CFT deformed by mu. And then you could ask, what is the relationship, if any, between these two deformed theories? And if you deform by both, say both deformed by TT bar and WW bar, does that combined flow have any nice properties? So for instance, you can ask, does it commute if you first deform by TT bar and then deform by WW bar? That seems very mysterious to me because it's not even obvious to me that after TT bar deforming, you would even be able to identify the W and W bar higher spin currents anymore. Since generally after, de after deforming by TT bar, there's no more conformal symmetry. There's no way of identifying what is W and W bar since there's no Virasoro. So that, that question seems um, potentially difficult to me, but potentially very interesting since now there's two deformations to play with. Uh, I always wonder how to calculate that this W3 charge or current. I mean, we know how to calculate the energy moment tensor many ways, but the W, well, I only know the free case, but uh, 
for highly interacting quantum field theory, I, is there some some way to evaluate this W Korean W three uh, current? I don't know how to do it on the field theory side. I have a guess for how to do it in the bulk, which is um, there's a there's a paper by Campolioni et al about um, these higher spin theories. And in that case, they have a nice packaging in the SL3 case where yes. you could make this Wielbein, there's a generalized Wielbein that looks like um, E mu A times the usual SL2 generators like LA, L plus minus and zero, plus a spin two Wielbein, E mu AB times TAB, where now TAB are the tensor generators of the SL3. And then in this case, the metric can be written in a nice way as the trace of a symmetrized trace of E mu times E nu. But the spin three fields, which they write as var phi, can be written as a trace of three of these Wielbeins, E uh, mu nu rho, all symmetrized. So I don't know how to compute the W current in the field theory, but I have a guess that if you attempt to take the variation of the bulk action with respect to the spin three field, which I now know how to do because I can write it in terms of Wielbeins and I see how those are related to the generators. You might imagine that in the same way as vary, varying the bulk action with respect to the metric gives you the Brown-York stress tensor, it might be that varying with respect to the spin three field would give you a tractable way to find the corresponding spin three current, at least in terms of bulk variables. Um, but that's very speculative. I don't know if that if that is useful, but it's maybe something. Um, maybe I just said uh, like uh, even though field theory is a little difficult, but the trans ion gravity part maybe just generalizing the this SL two trans ion to the SL three maybe. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, seems interesting, but. Uh, Potentially, potentially more difficult. Uh, it would be very interesting to understand the W algebra interpretation of this, though. But um, yeah. that I, I have no intelligent comments to make on on that question. Okay. Uh, is there uh, a question? One, one simple question: What about the entropy with respect to this Kitiba deformation? Is there any concrete expression? Oh, for the entropy. Um, yeah, entropy flow with respect with respect is lambda deforming. Good. So you can you can write down a flow equation for the partition yes. function, um, and then I think you could extract the entropy by taking appropriate derivatives. Um, or uh, yeah, but I never, yeah, but I never saw the complete explicit expression because, as far as I understand, this is of course is related with some. From yeah, party-like mm -hmm. formula to yeah, string-like behavior. Some mm -hmm. with risk, yeah. That's that's the motivation. So that's right. No, I agree with you. I think I, I I've seen the partition function formula written down, but I've never seen anyone explicitly write the entropies. Uh, I think that's true. Good question. Though. It's uh, now that you say it, it's surprising to me that no one has, has written that down since it seems like a natural thing to do. I see. Okay. Uh, you mean the entanglement in entropy? In, 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 we, we are thermodynamic entropy. So, what I'm thinking is so, so you know, the, if you, if the UV completion of positive, I mean, cosine lamp, kiki body form theory will be some string then some if I think some some high temperature or some high energy some we may see some string type entropy it at high energies I mean even by some I don't know possible or something I don't know I <laughs> just I recently yeah so and so this Titiva deform theory I mean, because he found some Hagedon transient temperature, so maybe, so, I mean, he, so yeah. Then entropy, yeah, flow shows some field theory like to string like some, um, well, classical to quantum, whatever, yeah, it should show. But uh, of course, as he pointed out, 
So, kaya sa action pang yung flow pag never so, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Th- that's the motivation of this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. No, I agree. I mean, it even though it could be, I guess, extracted from the partition function, I could imagine that looking at a flow directly for the entropy instead might give you some kind of smoother picture, I guess, when as you can you could see things going from kind of the ordinary uh, entropy type behavior to the entropy associated with the Hagedorn density of states or something like that. So it's um, I, I don't think it's written been written down, as you say. Maybe people think that it's uh, too trivial because it can just be extracted from the partition function or the density of states or something like that. But um, it, in, in principle, I mean, it could be interesting to do. Thank you. Okay. Is there any other question? Uh, if not, let's thank the speaker again. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, yes. So, so will you show me the the big picture on the almost the first page? So I'm so so the map web. Oh, sorry. So, the, yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. Fine. Good. Yeah. Oh. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. I hit yeah, the wrong so, okay, so, 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 will you summarize? Sorry, this is somewhat stupid question. So, will you summarize what you showed? But some part you touched the boundary. Some, so I'm somewhat confused. So, I mean, this, this is just I'm very elementary. Will you summarize what you did within this? Yeah. So what you defined and what is the result and blah, blah. Yeah, good. So yeah, yeah the summary, I, I, I guess. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. sure. So yeah, if I understand correctly, it's, it's asking, what, so what did we do in the in view of this picture? So what we did is um, asked, I guess, here's one way of saying it. There's a known, known TT bar deformation um, for say a quantum mechanical theory such as a 1D particle on a group. So this is from Gross and friends wrote down a known deformation of TT bar for the quantum mechanics. What we did was write down a change in boundary conditions for the 2D BF theory, which is dual to that quantum mechanics, which is induced by that TT bar flow. So if you do the TT bar flow on the right side for the particle on the group, that induces a change of boundary conditions holographically in the 2D BF theory. So that was the first thing that we did. Then there were various consistency checks that we made sure that that was compatible with TT bar deformations in 3D transsimons and dimensional reducing, um, TT bar deformations in JT gravity and changing variables. We verified that all of the edges in the graph were somewhat consistent, which I mean, it, Maybe it sounds somewhat repetitive because we're doing the same thing in many different choices of variables, but it's a, a good consistency check. And then uh, finally, after that, we did some calculations where we computed um, Wilson lines. So there were kind of Wilson lines in uh, 3D transsimons. So we computed Wilson lines here under a TT bar deformation using the change of variables that others have come up with. So that was using the input from previous papers to do calculations that had not been done before. And then we also used the change in boundary conditions from BF theory, which we did come up with. That was our result. So we used our results to also calculate Wilson lines in the 2D BF theory. So it was several several um, place, places all over the web, I guess. Um, that's what we did. Oh, so one, one final question, sorry. So you previously mentioned, pointed out some little string theory. Can you, I mean, go this through from top down? I mean, starting from little string. And so uh, I don't, this question is, I mean, maybe somewhat too naive. So start, suppose starting from little string then you made some part, I don't know how to rewrite, reformulate in terms of some. Mm-hmm. So the question is how uh, how is little string theory related to a version of TT bar? Is that the question? Yes, yes. Then can you, I mean, reverse, can you do reverse work? Starting from, um, this is too naive. I mean, yeah, I do not have any, yeah. 
Yeah, no, it's a good question. It's it's um it's unfortunately not very well explained in the literature, so um, it's, it's difficult to get a good picture of this. But um, here's the way that I understand it. So um, little string theory is a theory on NS5 brains. So if you begin with say a supergravity solution that has f strings and NS5 brains, so some number of each of them, um, this is a supergravity solution which is describing part of the vacuum of little string theory. What does this look like? Well, there's some radial direction with the property that at the origin, you have the location of the strings in the brains at the origin. And then as you go further away in the radial direction, there's first a region where, well, in the deep bulk, I guess, very close to the strings in five brains, the space-time looks like ADS3 in this three-dimensional subspace. As you go further away in radius, you now enter a linear diloton region. So there's a linear diloton space-time. And then as you go further away, you eventually get to a flat region. So it's asymptotically flat. Now, the claim is that deep in the bulk, there's an ADS3 type space-time. That ADS3 type space-time is dual to some CFT2. So there's some CFT2. Um, the claim is that as you go radially outwards from the ADS3 bulk to the linear diloton space-time, the interpretation of going radially outwards is going from a CFT2 to a CFT2 deformed by some irrelevant operator. So the interpretation of going radially outwards in the bulk is performing some TT bar type deformation in the CFT2. But this TT bar is not the usual one. But sorry, go on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah I'm listening. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. I thought there was a question. Um, uh, good, good. So the, um, the the TT bar deformation here that takes you from the deep bulk, the theory dual to the deep bulk ADS3, to the theory which is somehow dual to the intermediate region, it's some irrelevant operator whose identity is not exactly known. It's called the single trace TT bar deformation because um, if the theory, if the CFT dual to this ADS bulk, were a symmetric product. So if it were a symmetric pr product of the form um, CFT, n copies of a CFT modulo the symmetric group SN, a symmetric product, um, in that case, you could imagine two different deformations, right? You could imagine taking a sum of each stress tensor TI, where now I labels each of the copies, right? Each factor of the CFT. You could either do this, where you add up in each factor, you take T times T bar, in that factor, or you could imagine doing the sum of all of the t's times the sum of all of the t bars, right? You could do two different things. So in this case of the symmetric product, this first operator where you multiply the t's times the t bars is called single trace. And the second operator where you first add up all the t's and then multiply it by the sum of all the t bars is called double trace. So, the reason why this operator is called single trace is because if the CFT dual to ADS3 were a symmetric product, it would look like this single trace form. However, the name is something of a misnomer since it's known that the CFT, which is dual to ADS is not the symmetric product, but it's the symmetric product deformed by some marginal operator. So in fact, the single trace TT bar is not really the single trace thing I've written down. It's something more complicated, um, but schematically um, that's that's kind of why this is related to little string theory because it, it's telling you something about the the dynamics of a gravity solution related to ns5 brains and little string theory lives on the ns5 brain world volume so so in this case uh i see yeah, it's a bit messy i hope i'm sorry for the the complicated answer, but um, uh, there's. There, I should mention there's also a world sheet description since you could ask about um, a string theory, the strings with target space, ADS2. So you could imagine a world sheet, um, you know, the world sheet string with a, a sigma and a tau and the target space for the world sheet string is ADS3. So then there's a world sheet theory. Um, from the perspective of the world sheet, there's a different and better definition of this operator. So up here, I attempted to give you a definition of single trace TT bar in terms of the CFT dual to the space-time ADS3. 
Um, that CFT is different from the CFT on a string world sheet whose target space is CFT, is ADS3, sorry. That's a different theory. Um, from the world sheet theory, there is a so-called JJ bar. So there's a marginal deformation where J is built out of the um, SL2 currents of the ADS3. So you can construct some marginal operator on the world sheet out of those currents. And it's believed that performing that marginal world sheet deformation corresponds to doing this irrelevant um, deformation of the CFT2, um, which is holographically dual to the ADS3. So um, I don't know if that helps, if that makes it more or less confusing, um, but it's there's many different ways to define this single trace TT bar deformation. And it's, um, it's still an active research area. I think it's still very confusing. I see. Okay. But uh, I didn't understand fully, but yeah, at least I, I have feeling. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> thank okay. you very much. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you. And uh, then the let's call it a day. And uh, give me a sec. I will stop the recording.